Yes, I am. And I'm prepared to give you a little presentation about it. Okay. Thank you very much, and um, good evening. Good evening. Well, Joyce, thank you, and thank you um, all, to all the council members and everybody who's gathered here today. Uh, I'll just jump right into it. Uh, earlier this year, the city of L.A. was sued for the way that it treats homeless people and the way that it maintains the public right-of-way in a case known as L.A. Alliance versus Los Angeles. Overseeing that uh, federal lawsuit is a, is a federal judge named David Carter. And a few years ago, this, car, this judge famously presided over similar litigation against Orange County uh, cities regarding the way that they were treating homeless people. In that case, and several similar ones, they came to a compromise settlement where each city in the county would provide shelter for at least 60% of its homeless population, and then they could go back to enforcing no sleeping on the sidewalks in that city. This judge is trying to forge the same type of settlement in the city of LA, but he's looking at doing it on a district by district basis, because in LA, our council districts are literally bigger in population than every single one of those 28 cities where he's forged such a settlement. This would mean that each district in the city would be responsible for sheltering at least 60% of the homeless population in their district. In my case, in our case in the third district, we have 606 unsheltered people, according to the last homeless count in January 2020. That means at least 365 beds. My goal is to find 100% beds for all of the folks who are homeless. Now, my district has the fewest number of homeless people compared to any other district in the city. That and means no housing this goal is very doable. And so I jumped at the opportunity to expand shelter in my district while also addressing public health concerns on our streets. So I've spent the last several months uh, since this lawsuit started trying to find additional places that would be willing and able to host homeless interim housing. Uh, and also, importantly, this lawsuit has leveraged incredible new resources from the county. They've agreed to pay $300 million to the city, money they should have been paying a long time ago, $60 million a year for five years to help create 6,100 new shelter beds. This funding breakthrough, combined with state money and COVID federal funds, has created an amazing opportunity. It's an opportunity I have been highly focused on seizing. The good news is that my team and I were able to secure eight new sites, eight new shelter sites, all of which will be opening between now and May for a total of more than 400 new shelter beds, which is 10 times as many shelter beds currently exist, not just in my district, but at the entire West Valley, west of the 405. This is huge, and I'm very proud of that success. The first site to open will be the Bridge Home in Canoga Park with 80 beds off Satikoy, Hopefully opening in January, followed by 36 additional beds being added to our local domestic violence shelter, something I was able to fund directly through my office account. This is in addition to funding I received recently secured to be able to allocate additional units to Tarzana Treatment's drug rehab program that's in connection with Providence Cedars Hospital, a partnership that I helped forge about two years ago. Uh, and we're also installing safe parking uh, in a lot in Canoga Park for those homeless individuals living in their car and have several other potential sites for uh, safe parking, all of which will complement the safe parking already behind my district office. In addition, we're transforming two hotels that were leased as an emergency effort during COVID-19 to house homeless people, what was known as Project Room Key Hotels, into transitional and permanent supportive housing now known as Project Home Key Hotels. One is the Super 8 in Canoga Park, the other is the Howard Johnson's in Reseda. You may have heard of other hotels uh, in this program that are in the, in the Room Key program closing down. I fought hard to make sure that these hotels in my district stayed in the system. They now will be transformed and they represent another 125 rooms, which is potentially 250 beds. Finally, we're installing two cabin communities in my district one in Reseda right behind my district office, and one on top of them in Tarzana, just west of Reseda by the Orange Line. Each of these cabin communities will consist of tiny homes installed on a parking lot, and they will include a, prim a privacy perimeter fencing, 24 seven security, bathrooms, laundry, shower on site, food provided, case management services, so everyone on site will be with a social worker to transition to a more permanent home. Together, these contain 125 
cabins. Each cabin holds one person or a couple during COVID, but theoretically could hold they each could hold two beds or 250 people when COVID restrictions have been lifted. All of the above projects I just mentioned are already greenlit and funded. With that said, the search isn't over. And I've uh, said it before and I'll say it again. I want to see all five communities in my district host at least one site that helps address our homeless crisis. I want to see a future in my district where when one person becomes homeless, they go to a shelter, not the street. Other shelter opportunities, such as congregate housing, social housing, rapid rehousing, which means getting people directly into apartments, master leasing, etc., are all great opportunities and are on the table as well. I also want to say we uh, have Triple H funding coming our way for two permanent supportive housing developments, which will provide a total of 100 permanent supportive units in the near future. That's in addition to the Winnetka Village that we've had for a couple of years. And that will allow people living temporarily in our cabin communities to transition to more permanent homes within the district. So that's the good news. And I want to talk about that portion. Uh, I also want to talk about the portion of the deal that has sparked some controversy. And what I mean is, how do we keep areas clear once people have been offered a dry, warm bed indoor? Having hundreds of beds in the district will allow us to keep sidewalks and public space clear, but most particularly, within 500 feet of a freeway and in proximity 500 feet to a local shelter. As you may have noticed recently, if you drive through uh, the Winnetka or Corbin underpass or any of the underpasses in my district, there are far, far fewer people living in the underpasses today than there were several weeks ago. This is the result of a six week pilot program that culminated in an intensive two week effort with Judge Carter, LASA, LA Family Housing, the Volunteers of America, my staff, and myself. LASA agreed to do this pilot program after I begged them for help with our underpasses. And they were under pressure to show that their various interventions could work on, the, on a location-specific basis, which is something they really hadn't done before. It's new to them. They accepted the challenge, and we found the needed shelter space. Bottom line, every person who had been living in the underpasses was offered a better alternative whether through rapid rehousing, a bridge home, detox bed, motel room. They were told that they would not be allowed under the freeways after March 27th. And in a two week period, we helped 57 people into a better situation. We enrolled them with LA Family Housing Case Management to make plans for a better life than living under the 101 freeway. No LAPD officers were involved. No one was arrested. No one had their belongings taken or seized. We proved the naysayers who said that these folks and a lot of these folks were, were addicted to drugs, that they would never accept services. Well, we proved them wrong. We also proved the value of a choice state. As many of these folks who have been offered shelter in the past, and I know because I was out there offering them shelter for a year, for two years, uh, many of them needed that extra incentive to overcome the inertia. The underpasses are not completely clear right now. And you may notice, even though we got Everyone housed, a few people, and some piles of belonging remain. That is because the city's laws are out of date, and they need to be updated to keep the freeway and other areas clear once people have been offered an appropriate alternative. Right now, there are three people in these underpasses as of today. Two of them have accepted hotel rooms and are currently enrolled in Project Room Key, um, but they still choose to spend some evenings in the underpass. One person is new to the area. This is why six colleagues and I, the maximum number that you can have uh, before you have eight, which is uh, automatic, introduced a motion to update the city's laws, to rewrite laws that were deemed unconstitutional in a very, um, and to rewrite them in a constitutional way, a very narrow but constitutional way. There are some of you, who, uh, many people here who've mounted a call-in campaign today who strongly disagree with this decision, and I respect that. But there are a couple of important reasons I'm supporting the plan for buffer zones under the freeway and in close proximity to shelter sites. First, it's a practical decision. Several of the sites that we're looking at for shelter have indicated explicitly that they will only be willing to host a shelter site if there was a guarantee that their property would not become a magnet for other encampments or storage or belongings on the sidewalk immediately adjacent to it. This means that in order to get the beds we need, 
we also need the promise of the ability to keep the areas clean and clear. Second is for the dignity of the people who are living in these new shelters. For these formerly homeless people to feel like neighbors in a community and for them to feel like they're actually progressing, their environment needs to look and feel different than living on the street. If the new shelter walls are surrounded by tents, it will be harder for folks to rehabilitate. Third is for public confidence, that giving people a bed not only gives someone a safe place to sleep, but it also makes the community sidewalks and freeway areas cleaner and passable. I firmly believe we meet, will need to show to the entire district that we have a shelter in your that having a shelter in your community increases the cleanliness of your local sidewalks, while also helping the people who previously lived on those sidewalks. This is the only way we'll be able to move forward with additional projects in the years to come and convince additional communities to accept additional shelters. A 500 foot buffer is not a lot to ask, but it will make a big difference for that shelter and for that neighborhood. Again, in my district, we got over 60 people off the street humanely with no police interaction or arrests. And when a federal judge, and when a federal judge has declared that these areas, the freeway uh, underpasses are unsafe and unhealthy to live, we should be able to keep them clear for pedestrians to use those sidewalks. That judge is still monitoring what we're doing and we need to be able to, to uh, meet his expectations, especially here in the West Valley when those underpasses are critical corridors that connect thousands of pedestrians to schools, grocery stores, and essential services, and when the only other alternatives are too far away to be used. I know a lot of you, a lot of you here used to send me videos of people walking in the street because they couldn't get past the Winnetka uh, underpass or kids going to Taft High School. Amending the city codes 5611 and 4118 will allow the city to enforce anti-camping laws in very specific locations once housing has been offered to the people there. Specifically, this proposal would do several things. Allow buffer zones to prohibit camping or storage of belongings within 500 feet of new homeless service centers like bridge housing, cabin communities, and freeway underpasses. It would necessitate a separate city council approval by resolution for each buffer zone. So it doesn't automatically happen. You need a separate resolution um, before that area is made off limits to camping. And the council would only pass a freeway underpass resolution once they were convinced that every person living in that underpass had been offered appropriate shelter. And the council would have to explicitly make findings that doing so was to promote public health, safety, or welfare. Furthermore, the council will have the opportunity to draw up protocols, and this was explicitly stated in the city attorney's accompanying report to this motion, that we need to draw up protocols to make sure that the areas are kept clear and passable in ways that do not criminalize people, but give them every opportunity to, to do so voluntarily. In the initial draft ordinance, there was some confusing and overly broad language drafted that I'm working to remedy. People believe the law could effectively ban camping anywhere in the city, which is not the intent and certainly not my intent. This would have been wrong on several levels, but most importantly because we don't have enough available housing alternatives and therefore wouldn't be compliant with relevant court decisions. But also, throughout our uh, Judge Carter proceedings on the LA Alliance case, he has made it crystal clear that we need this ordinance. We need an ordinance like this one on the books so that the more than 6,000 beds that come online because of this case, that the city can ban camping under the freeways. He has said every other city he has dealt with has such an ordinance. And he has said that 99% of the time, enforcement is not even an issue. As more housing and shelter is built, the council can vote for what streets can have this sort of buffer or anti-camping protection. But that's in the future for when we get the housing. I've worked with neighborhood councils, local stakeholder groups, neighborhoods to earn support for many of the housing, uh, homeless alternative housing projects that are underway. And one thing has been clear. Almost every group has said that in order to get their support, there needs to be a plan so that homeless services don't need more encampments around that site, many of which are adjacent to residential communities or right across the street from residential communities. I've told you and every organization that I would work to do just that. So we're where could this apply in the West Valley if the council passes this ordinance? For example, right now, our bridge housing site that's opening up in Canoga Park is under construction. We have two cabin communities funded, soon to be under construction. 
one at the metro lot in Topham, the other at my office parking lot. All of these sites, once they would open, we could introduce, we could, if this motion passes that's before you, when we're opening up these other sites, we would then be able to introduce a resolution to say that we want to have a 500 foot buffer around these new areas. Ultimately, I believe if someone has been offered appropriate alternative shelter, bridge hotels, etc., they do not have to accept it. But if they choose not to accept it, um, there are limits to where they can camp and where they can put their belongings. Uh, and they can't be in certain areas like in front of someone's home or near services, near bridge home or cabin communities and the like. We have a right, I would say an obligation, to keep some areas off limits to setting up encampments. Also, if someone has been given shelter bed or a hotel room and is fed and provided for by the city, county, and at the taxpayer's expense, it's reasonable to ask that they accept some societal norms and not maintain a second tent dwelling or, or put their personal belongings on the public right-of-way next to that shelter. Sometimes people have a, a room in a bridge home or motel and they come back to their tent uh, a few nights a week because they want that lifestyle. You and our community deserve to be able to set limits on where that tent and belongings can be stored when we are providing appropriate shelters. To do that, we need to update our city's laws. The proposed update is extremely limited in scope. I'm sure there are many people here who wish that it were much broader in scope. So again, this ordinance doesn't criminalize homelessness throughout the city as it has been or will be characterized by some. All this ordinance does is create a framework so that as we get more home bridge housing and cabin communities and open more room key sites like the two in my district, we'll have reasonable tools so if needed, we can ensure that encampments don't grow outside of the new service sites and in areas that are unsafe under the freeways. Because we don't want this effort to be the end of our homeless plan, we want to think long term, especially considering the grim realities that we're facing economically because of COVID. I believe that a constitutional, humane update to our ordinance is the only way to get to that reality. As counterintuitive to some people as that may sound. So, as a basic sketch of my plan to address homelessness, this is a basic sketch of how to get this, this very narrow motion is part of that overall approach. It is not the approach, it is just a mere part of it. I look forward to hearing your thoughts, answering your questions, and I know everyone on this call is interested in being part of the solution for homelessness. This is the problem that is, that is, is, is plaguing our, um, our city, our community. It is, it is one of the most important issues that we can deal with and it's, it is dealing with people's lives. So I thank you all for your tireless advocacy, and I appreciate the work that all of you do and the volunteer work all of you as neighborhood council members put in. Uh, thank you for the time.